Welcome back to the Amazon clone. In this video, we'll be focusing on setting up Redux. So we'll be using Redux Toolkit alongside with TypeScript to structure our application. And this is how you would go about structuring a large application. So we're gonna focus on setting it up as if we were building out an enterprise application. So what I should currently note is if you haven't already installed this project and been following along so far i've currently got this mongodb um, that's running in a docker container so when you come to the root of the project you just have to run docker compose up space d so you can run that in detached mode then you also have to go into each of the amazon and the api folders run npm install and then run those servers. So I'm going to start off by just opening up my terminal here. And as you can see, that's already running. So I'm actually going to stop the server because I'm going to need some dependencies here. So I'm just going to run an npm install and I'm going to get the Redux JS toolkit. I'm also going to get the React Redux. I'm also going to get Axios, so I can make HTTP requests. I'm going to get .env to have some environment variables for the URL. And I'm also going to have JWT decode, which will decode our JSON web token into an object of the data. So I'll go ahead and install those. And while that's installing, I'll just briefly mention why we use Redux. And the main purpose of using Redux is for state management. And as you build out your project, you have more and more components and you will need to have a consistent state all throughout the application. And if you have lots of parents and children components and lots of sibling components, that can get really messy really quick. You have lots of prop drilling where you, you know, basically refer to props um, and pass those in and then they can get quite deep. It's okay to do that for small projects, but if you're doing an enterprise grade project, you really want some sort of state management. We've also talked about um, the reducer hook and we talked about that in the previous video. So the concepts of Redux build off that. Um, it's just gonna be a little more sophisticated. And of course you could just use context um, to structure your application. And there's nothing really wrong with that, uh, particularly for smaller or medium sized projects. Um, but Redux is a little bit more performant than the context. Um, and also you won't have nested context um, and you know they will bloat out your code base. So if you're building out like proper software, I'd recommend a heavy hitting state management. Of course, there's so many different ways you can manage state. Um, any of them is fine, but the main thing is just having consistent variables that you can reference throughout your application without too much prop drilling and stuff like that. So we're going to focus on using the new Redux toolkit and we're going to do it with TypeScript. So now we've got our dependencies set up, let's go ahead and get started. So just to mention the um, concepts that we're building off here, uh, similar to how we have our own input hook here, where we're using a reducer. Essentially what we're doing in Redux is we're you know, conforming to the flux design pattern. So we trigger an action such as a clicking of a button or logging in, for example, um, that fires an action. Uh, it then goes to a reducer, which is basically a switch case statement. Um, it's a pure function. So there's no side effects or anything like that. So you always, for whatever you put into the function, you always get a consistent result. And then that updates the store or the global state. And then we subscribe to that. And that's how we get consistent, um, you know, variables across our and state across our application. So I should mention that we will be focusing on setting up the state for both synchronous and asynchronous uh, operations. <clears throat> So um, with asynchronous stuff, there's Redux Thunk and there's just an extra uh, configuration setting to do there. 
Um, so we're going to pretty much follow that structure for this video. We're going to focus on the authentication stuff, the login, the registration, setting up that states, getting a global user in our store, um, the loading states, all that sort of stuff. And we can pretty much copy this format that we're going to establish in this video to, you know, pretty much code anything we want, state management for any Redux based um, React project. And we're also using TypeScript. So let's just get into it. So just in the Amazon front end project here, the first thing we want to do is we want to create a store. So we'll do this in the root of our project. So we'll have a file here, we'll call this store.ts. And notice it's ts, not tsx. That's because we're going to not need the, um, you know, the JSX, it's just TypeScript code basically. So what we'll do is we'll start off by importing something. And we're going to import the configure store method. And that's coming from Redux Toolkit. We're also, we're going to need a reducer. So we'll come back to that. But what we'll do here is we'll just go ahead and we'll export a constant variable called store. This is what we're subscribing to um, to access the global state. So this is like the central place that all of our data will be. Um, and I should notice that we don't actually put everything in the store. If there's some component specific state, there's no need to put in the global store. Um, we only put stuff in the store that we're going to use elsewhere in the application. Um, so that's one common mistake people first make when they use uh, Redux for the first time. They think they need to put everything in there. And while you can do that, it sort of bloats it out and makes it more complicated than it needs to be. Um, but nevertheless, we'll be focusing on using that in our video. So we just need to call this configure store method from Redux Toolkit. And it takes a reducer, it takes an object, and part of that object is it takes this reducer um, configuration here. And what this is, is this is where all of our reducers will be. So for example, we had in our, that hook there, for example, we had like one reducer, I suppose, specifically for the input. So you can imagine that's the input reducer, but you can imagine if we talk a little higher level and we're splitting things into features, for example, we got this auth page for now, that's a whole feature. And then in the future, we'll have like a product feature, for example, we want to split it by feature essentially um, and have our reducers for each one of those features. So the feature that we're going to have here to start off with is the auth reducer. That's going to be its own, um, you know, module, if you will. And we're going to need to import the auth reducer in there. So I'm going to do that in just a moment. I'll just put null here as a placeholder. Um, so after we do that, we're going to need to export the type, which is going to be the root state. This is what we're creating. We're creating this type here. We're in TypeScript. And we can actually just go ahead and we can just have the return type where it's going to be the type of the store.getState. So that's built in, that's built in, um, that method here, get state, it's built into the Redux toolkit. And essentially we're gonna pass in our reducers and they're all gonna be set up. And we can just access this method here to get the state. Um, but, you know, that's not really the type of it, that's like the state of the application. So if we get the type of that, we can make the return type of that, the type of the uh, state object of the store. So we'll use that and reference that throughout our application. And then we can go ahead and we can export another variable or another type here. And I'm gonna call this app dispatch, which is gonna be the type of the store and the dispatch method. So this might make a little bit more sense when we set it up, but essentially, if you've been following along this video series and we've set up that reducer before, you know, like the input reducer, for example, it has a state 
associated with it. For example, is the input text, is it erroring, is it not erroring? But it also has actions associated with it. Um, so like, you know, did you type something in? You know, should we update the text? Those sorts of things. So they're the actions. And when it comes to actions, we call it dispatching actions. And this is sort of, this is going to be the global state. So it's going to have all of the actions from the auth section, but it's also going to have them all from the product section in the future. And likewise with the state. Um, <clears throat> and we, we need that uh, to be able to reference it throughout the application, as we'll see. Um, so I'm going to create the, um, well, we need a auth reducer. So one thing to note is in um, Redux Toolkit, you have this notion of slices. So essentially you can break up your project into, you know, slices, if you will. And it's the slices that are used in conjunction uh, with, you know, the reducers. Um, so let's just work through that. And I think that wasn't very clear explanation, but if we just work through an example here, the way we're going to structure this is we've got this features section here. And right now we've got this auth section within features and we've got components, which are all our auth related uh, components. Um, and then we've also got the models, which are the interfaces or types. I'm going to have another file in here. And I'm going to have it in the base because it's a quite important file. And I'm going to call this authslice.ts. And this is essentially, um, it's going to have our methods that we um, need for our authentication. So, you know, the registration, um, the login method, the logout method, verifying the JWT, we'll set that up uh, shortly. And then we can go ahead and use those methods and we can create a slice. So a slice is nothing more than, you know, the, it's essentially the reducer that we're referring to. So we're going to have the all slice and that's going to have a whole bunch of functionality in there. And then if we add other slices, um, you know, you sum the slices up together and then you get a whole sort of thing and that'll be the global store, the whole um, sum of the slices. So I'm going to call this slice. It's sort of conventional, although not strictly necessarily um, enforceable to just call it whatever your feature is. So we got auth here and then followed by slice here. Um, so that's just a naming convention, but as, as I saw in the documentation, but of course you could call it whatever you want. Um, so we're going to have this great slice and that's going to come from the Redux toolkit. And basically we need to give a slice a name. So this one's just going to be auth, so we can reference it. It's also going to take an initial state. Um, so let's create a variable here called the initial state. And I'll just copy this here. And this is going to be of the type auth state, which we also need to make. So let's go ahead and just get our state, our interfaces we need. So the first bit of, um, the first model we'll have is we'll have an async state. And we'll eventually refactor this higher. So I'll put a to-do here. To-do move higher. But for now, we've only got one um, reducer. So I'm just going to leave it here. And this is going to be the base state. So for asynchronous operations, like let's say we make a HTTP request, make an API request. There's going to be a part where that HTTP request is loading. So is it loading? And I'm also going to have a variable Boolean uh, flag for if it was successful or if it was erroring. And we can actually use this, you know, this base async state to create a interface for our auth state. So I'm just going to say we have an object here or an interface auth state and that goes 
and it is, extends the async state. Now, I'm going to make all of these optional um, because you can fire actions where only some of these variables are needed. So if I just say we have a user here and actually we're going to need to create some models here. So what do we got so far? We got new user and register form field. Let's go ahead and create a display user. I'm avoiding using the word user because they'll become overloaded quite quickly. Um, so you can have an export an interface. I notice I didn't put the dot interface extension here. Uh, maybe I'll add that in. Dot interface dot ps where this new user that's just a type here. Um, so I'm going to export an interface called display user. And it's going to be different to the new user um, because we're not going to show the password and stuff like that. So let's just go ahead and we'll just get the ID here, which is a string, a name, which is a string, and an email, which is a string. I'll save that, let Prettier reformat that particular type there. I'm going to have a, another model for the JSON web token. So I'm just going to get all these models out of the way. Um, and then we'll come back to using them and consuming them. So this one's going to be pretty easy. We know from the back end we're getting a JSON web token. So I'm just going to have a type for JSON web token, which is just going to be the token, the object with the token in it, which is a string, uh, but it can also be null. So I'm just setting up the interfaces that we're going to be using. Um, of course, we're going to have the decoded token as well. Uh, that might not be clear what that looks like. Um, if you're not too familiar with JSON web tokens, but essentially what we'll have here is we'll export an interface and I'll call it decoded token or decoded JWT. It's just going to have our data that we get back, which is of the display user type. Um, but it's also going to have an expiration and initialization on it. So these are, I believe they're in milliseconds or seconds uh, after, you know, the epoch time after 1970 or whatever it is. Um, so these will just be numbers here. And then we have an, when it was created, which is a number. So it's essentially our payload of data plus an expiration and, you know, an instantiation time there. So that's nice and simple. I'm just trying to think what other... Um, so we've got the coded JWT interface, display user interface, JWT. Uh, we might need one more for the login user. We've got the new user and we've got the register form field interface. Let's go ahead and make a login user interface.ts. And that's just going to be the interface login user. And we log in with an email and a password, which is a string. So I think we've got most of our interfaces and types ready to go. So we can actually come back to our auth slice and we can, you know, create the particular type. So for our user, this is going to be a display user. Um, but, you know, it might be null as well. If, you know, they're not currently logged in or something like that. There's going to be a JWT. That's going to be of the type JWT because we put the, uh, could be null inside the type itself. Um, of course, that's optional. You could do it here as well. Um, you want to be more consistent in your interfaces, uh, but that's up to you. 
And we're going to have an is authenticated property, which is going to be a Boolean. And that's going to signal to our application, you know, can you go to certain pages? Maybe we'll restrict the, you know, we can't see the product page, for example, if they're not logged in. Um, or we'll reroute them to the login page, things like that. That's what we'll use that particular flag for. Um, so now we can create our initial state based off that auth state type there. So let's just go ahead and just copy these properties. And we'll copy these as well. We'll get rid of the types, of course. Uh, let's see here. I'm just going to alt click and then go, uh, was it shift end backspace? Uh, I'm just going to make this false and then a comma. And then I'm just going to refer to the user and refer to the JWT here. Um, and we're going to actually, you know, Actually, for now, we'll come back to this because we're going to need to get these from local storage. Let's just set everything to false. So actually, what I had was fine. Um, we're going to come back to using local storage to get our JSON web token and user object. Um, and actually... Yeah, what have we got? Is loading a success? I might put these at the top here. I realized I've done it in a different order. Um, so that comment should refer to that. And that comment should refer to that there. Uh, of course, we don't need these either. So let me just do one of these again. Oh, actually, it is, a, it is an object notation. I thought it was an equals for some reason. So we have that there like that. Um, okay, so this is complaining. Um, yeah, okay. So maybe we'll, we'll need to come back to that. Let's just comment that out. It's not the right type. Maybe I'll make it null. And the JWT can also be null. Okay. So I want to focus on the actual Redux stuff before I get bogged into the details, that's all. So just to, you know, remember where we're up to in the Redux side of things, where essentially we're creating a store and a store needs a slice and we're just setting up that slice. And the because we're dealing with asynchronous stuff, we're going to also need a service for the Redux stunt to communicate the HTTP request. So we'll set all that up. So essentially, okay, we've got our auth slice here. And that's creating a slice based on the initial state. It's also going to need some reducers. So this is where the synchronous reducers are. So in our application, you know, if we want to display a spinner, for example, we have these variables that, um, you know, that we know, like for when we fire the API request off, you know, while it's loading, we know that, you know, we can set a Boolean flag, which isn't asynchronous. Um, and then we can track that data. And so what it means is when we say we're logging in, for example, while that's loading, in our screen, we can display a spinner. And then if it comes back successful, then we can do something else. But the actual spinner itself, the actual is loading, that isn't asynchronous. It's the asynchronous HTTP request, which is asynchronous, which updates that synchronous flag. Um, so in the reducers here, basically, um, well, it's going to be both synchronous and asynchronous. So let me actually start off with the extra reducers. So the extra reducers are the asynchronous reducers. 
and it just takes this builder um, argument here and that's how we can sort of build out the different cases that we have here so that sort of comes with the import essentially so yeah so when we have this builder here and then we can tack on methods i'm just going to put a comment in between although essentially it's the same thing as having something like this um i'm just going to have a comment here saying register because we're also going to have login and um, other things here so then i can add on a dot here and we can just add a case here and we can uh essentially have a case that we have something pending like the register methods pending or the login methods pending so we're actually going to need to create our actual async dunks so this is going to represent what the http request is so i'm going to do that below this initial state here i'm going to export a constant register and I'm just going to create an async thunk. And this is going to take, you know, some sort of, um, I'm gonna use the endpoint that we're using. So we have auth slash register, for example. And within the async function as a second argument next to the name, we can have an async function here. So when we register, we're going to need to take the new user. So we can take the new user type. So recall the new user is, um, you know, the, the name, email, and password. So when you log in with the form, you need that object. And then there's also this secondary argument it takes, which is the Thunk API. And that allows us to, you know, um, reject any Think that's not right that sort of comes with the method sort of thing in the same way this builder does um sort of like a callback it's a placeholder for a callback um so what we can do here is we can actually have a try catch because what we want to do is we want to wait we want to make a http request but if there's an error what we'll do is we'll just return and that's where we can use this stunk API because then we're able to reject with a value. And I'm just going, you can put objects and more sophisticated things in here. I'm just going to have unable to register the string. Um, and I'm just starting to realize we're going to need to actually build the service because we don't want this slice to be massive. It's already going to have a lot of state in it. It's already going to be quite um, big. Um, so let's delegate some of the logic out to a server. So we'll delegate the HTTP uh, request to its own services. So I'm actually going to create a new folder for this. And I'm just going to call this the auth service. So if you've been following along with Nest, it's sort of a similar concept, how you have the service, um, you know, which takes care of the HTTP layer or interacting with the database, if you will. Um, or well, in this case, we're interacting with the API through the service. And then the slice is more like the methods that we call that reference the services. So let's just go ahead and create our auth service. So our auth service, all we're going to do here is we're going to have a, a whole earth auth service is just an object that we can consume with methods on it because we want to uh, we want to do multiple things like we want to be able to register we want to be able to log in we want to be able to log out and also we want to be able to verify our json web token which we'll set up later on um, so what we want to do is we essentially want to export the auth service as a default method um, I'm just going to comment these out because we haven't built these just yet. So let's start to, you know, work on our service here. And I'll probably start off with the register. So let's just create a name function, call it register. 
Now it's going to take a new user of the type new user. And here's our code block. Now this is going to be an asynchronous function. So we need to put the async keyword before the, uh, you know, part of the signature. And it's going to, what we'll get back here is we'll get back a promise. And we're going to get back our display user or potentially null. Um, so we're going to need to import that. Get that display user type there. So I'm going to use Axios to make a HTTP request. Um, but before I do that, we've installed the env, um, .env uh, library. So what that allows us to do is in the root of our source folder, actually the root of our entire project here, we can create a file called .env. And for us to use this, we need to prefix our variables with react underscore app. And then after that, that's where we can have the name of the variable. So I'm gonna have here base underscore API. And there's no strings or, um, it just detects the strings based on the equal sign because we're not in a, you know, like a JS file, for example. So we can just write HTTP local host 3000 slash API. Because that's the node server that we're running on. That's the Nest.js server. And then that slash API is the main base point of our API. Of course, if you had a production application or anything like that, you'd have to have more of these and then choose out the variables as needed. Uh, but for our purposes, we'll just go ahead and use this React app base API. So with that, we can return back to our service here. And we can actually just go ahead and we can say, we want to get a response and we can just await and we're going to need Axios for this. Oh, it's not that one. Axios. So let's get that third party library up there at the top. And with Axios, we can just make, you know, typical requests. So I'm just going to copy this tilde sign in. Um, and the reason I'm not pressing it is because I'm on a multi language uh, keyboard. So that button's reserved. Um, but I sort of want the template literal. So I can access that variable that we just created by running process.env. Um, oh, now it's no longer in my buffer. But if I open this up here and copy this part here, we can get the base URL. Um, and then I actually just want to make the request um, to auth slash register, which is sort of the same thing as we named it here. So um, there are tools like React Query and React um, Toolkit Query that allow you to manage state in like more of the, uh, this sort of way where you interact with the API and then you set the state sort of thing. Um, but for a bigger enterprise application, it's more standard and um, accepted to use, you know, Redux. And the new thing now is Redux Toolkit, which is what we're doing. Um, maybe something I come back to another day. Um, of course, you can manage state however you want to. Like, there's multiple ways to do everything in this React ecosystem. But, um, you know, I'm just trying to show the, you know, standard way. Um, it's most likely if you get a job in the field or something like that. Um, so yeah, I can just go ahead and pass in the new user. That's going to be part of the um, body. It's all set up with JSON with the Axios library. So I'm like, fetch, you don't have to configure those sorts of things. And then essentially what we can do here is we can just return the response dot data. I might just put that on a line here. Um, 
So when they register, oh, I'll need this type. This is just thinking of making a HTTP request right now. So let's just think about that. Someone signs in, they type in their name, email, and password. We check that the password matches the confirmed password before sending it. Then, you know, we make a, we use Axios, we make a post request, and then we attach that part of the body. Um, <clears throat> and then all is well and good, we get a response and we get back the data. Otherwise, we'll get back an error. So we can actually send that register method off. And this is just shorthand for this if you haven't seen it already because the name I'm sending matches the variable. So I'm just going to call this register here. So let's go back to our auth slice. And we can say what we want to do is we want to return and we want to await all this auth service and now we can access that register method and then we can pass in our new user to that so that is essentially the um you know we made the service which is the http or the api endpoint request then we've put it into this async func which is an asynchronous operation such as an api request um now we have that register there, we can actually reference it in our slice. So let me just comment out reducers for a second. And we're gonna have extra reducers here. And with the extra reducers, we're able to build out things. So we can add the case that based on the register method, which is just this here, that we can access different states because we've made this as an async thunk. It's going to add and, you know, decorate it with its own um, properties or methods. So we can now detect if it's, you know, if we're making the HTTP request, it's pending. So this comes, you know, with the library. Um, so essentially it takes the state and the state, the type should be inferred anyway. Um, it won't be now because everything's erring, but when it's not erring, the state should be inferred. Um, so if I haven't brought out the type explicitly, it's probably inferred um, or should be inferred when there's no errors. Um, but essentially what we can do is see how we got this initial state here. Um, and then we got this is loading state. Well, what we can do is we can just say, we can get that state that we've passed in here. And we can say is loading. And we can set that to false. Um, why is this erroring so bad? <laughs> All slice equals create slice. Export from stock. I'm not sure. Okay, so I've just sort of adjusted the formatting here. Uh, I think this was like a double string instead of a string, a single quote, uh, and then the spacing here. Um, so if that's erring for you, just go ahead and copy it from my GitHub, that particular method. I don't know what was actually occurring there. I think I just missed a line um, in terms of the formatting here. As you can see, you've got this export constant auth slice, creating the slice which takes the object um, and that's what I had just before so I don't know it's not obvious to me what that was or if it was just a temporary glitch or something like that or if I missed a character but this is what it is now pause the screen um, or copy it from github um, so yeah you go ahead and you create an, a slice, you give it a name, give it the initial state. These are the synchronous reducers. These extra reducers are the asynchronous reducers. It takes this builder, um, you know, callback. This comes built in. Add the case. Now, this auth slice 
um, you know, it's referring to this register method, which has the HTTP request there. Um, and this pending, that's sort of a magic method. It comes with the creation of the slice. So what I can do is I can also have some other states here. So while the HTTP request is loading, we can go ahead and we can set the state is loading. If we get the state where it's fulfilled, again, that just comes built in that method. Um, what we can do is we can say set the state loading equal to false. We can set the state is success. We can set that to true because it actually made the request. And as a second argument, we can also get the payload. So this comes from the action and we can say, okay, we can have the state here. We have the state of the user and this is going to come from the action dot payload because we know when we register, we get back the um, user details and that user refers to the display user. So the name, email, and password. So we can get that from the action. So that's to say the state refers to the state up here in our initial state. Um, and that's where we set that. But for actual like asynchronous data that comes back, that often comes back through this action, through the payload of that action. So for example, you make the register action, make the HTTP request, you know, it makes the request, assuming everything's all good. Um, you get the payload back and we get the user back. We know that from creating our API call before. And we can go ahead and create another case here. So pretty much all of these, um, you know, HTTP or asynchronous uh, or async thunk based approaches, they all have these pending fulfilled and rejected state. So after you do one and set it up once, you can pretty much copy the same code. Um, I should probably also note, you don't actually have to um, set everything up from completely scratch. If you get the template, um, as I showed you in the previous videos, when you install the Create React app, you can actually have a template with Redux. Uh, the exact command is, you know, you could just Google it or go back a couple of videos to get that. I think it's dash just template Redux or something like that. Um, but that doesn't do the asynchronous stuff by default. And when you're doing state management, you usually want to be making API requests. Um, that's like a fundamental part of your application um, rather than the synchronous stuff. Plus there's lots of boilerplate. So I find it easier to just set it up from start because there's a whole bunch of boilerplate that gets in the way. Plus if you're doing it for the first time or even if you're doing setting it up another time, it's good to go through the steps. Um, because we're essentially we're creating the structure for our state management for our entire application and that means we're going to copy these same patterns all throughout the project um, so it's good to set it up properly the first time but after it's set up you can pretty much just you know copy it and paste the same way of you doing things and it ends up being quick and a consistent way of doing things uh, if you have multiple team members for example but this state here if it's rejected you try and register, but then you put in the wrong, maybe there's a duplicate email or something like that. I'm going to set the is error to true. And I'm going to say that the state of the user is going to be null. Okay. So that's pretty much that part of that slice there. Um, what we can do now, oh, and I added this here, export default all slice reducer. We want to reference that in our store. So 
let's go ahead and put that auth reducer in there, which means we need to import the auth reducer that we just created. And then I'll just use prettier to format things there. So what we've done so far is we've created this global store. We have a auth reducer. We split our reducers up into features. Authentication is a major feature, so that's going to have its own reducer. Then we have this notion of a slice, which is sort of the part of the whole. Um, so this is where we actually have some of the state for this particular section. So the authentication state. Um, we have this base authentication state, um, which we might refactor later on, because you can imagine if you're in a product, for example, and you need to make API recall, you're still going to have these models here, but we'll do that as needed. Um, and then we have state about the user, the JWT, and whether or not they're authenticated or not. Then we have a service. We create an async thung. So this is an asynchronous operation because um, by default, um, you know, if we're doing state management um, without that async thunk, everything's synchronous. So it's not, you know, expecting callbacks or promises or any of these sorts of things. So we need this special method, which comes built in um, to be able to, you know, have consistent state through asynchronous operations. Um, so you can imagine if you were actually creating the Redux library, it'll be, um, you know, it might be a little tricky to set up. So that's sort of done for us there. Um, we refer to a service. We delegate the logic to a, you know, an API call. We've set up our base API. We make the Axios call, and then we, you know, export our auth service register method. We consume that. We have this auth slice here. We've named it auth. We pass in the initial state. Um, and then we've built the registration. So you make the API call. It, it's based off this register method here. It's able to, you know, intercept that or detect the state. It adds these pending, fulfilled, and rejected um, part of the library. Um, and then that's where we can update our state. So is loading. Um, you know, if we're making the core, otherwise it's fulfilled, it's successful, we want the user. Uh, otherwise, it's an error, and then we don't want to uh, have a user. So that's the asynchronous side of things. Let's imagine that we, like, imagine we're using that from the form where we're typing in the data and then we're making the API request. And then let's say things are loading. I mean, that's all well and good, um, but how do we reset the state? So after, after you know, they get the success message, you know, let's say they make an API call, it's loading, uh, and then it's accepted or fulfilled. How are we going to better, you know, reset the state, let's say? Um, and we can do that synchronously. And this isn't just for this one method here, by the way. Uh, this will be for all of the reducers in here. Um, so as I extend this out, like you could have, for example, um, is register loading and is login loading and have a separation between the API calls, but it's not really necessary because it doesn't matter which API call you make, you're either going to be in the loading state or a successful state or an error state, and then you can change the UI accordingly. If you have more specific needs for your application, then you might want to get more involved, but less is more um, if you can do it with less. So without further ado, let's create our synchronous reducer. I'm going to have a method here called reset. It takes the state that's just automatically passed in um, based on you know our initial state and what the state is of the current application. Um, so for example, when you have the initial state, everything's false, but then you make one of these asynchronous calls, it, it might you know, be in the pending state, is loading true or is success true? Now, right now it's currently gonna stay in is success true? Um, that could be what you want. 
um, but we might want to have the ability to reset that state. So we might want to set the state is loading back to false. And for these, I'm using the base async state here. State is successful. Uh, and this allows us when we make one API call somewhere, make another one, it resets that shared state. So let's set is error equal to false. And okay, so we pretty much have what we need. Let's just create a, another file. Let's go to hooks because we're using TypeScript here. We need a good way to, when we consume this, from our components, we need a good way to hook into the state. So for example, here we've got this return state, which is the global state, and here's the global actions. Um, if we just have a hook um, that pretty much uses the React Redux hooks, we'll be able to get intelligence and IntelliSense all throughout our application, um, which is great. So in this source folder here, in this hooks folder here, we've got this input folder here. I'm going to have another, I'll create another file, uh, folder. I'll call it Redux. And then I'll do this slash. I can make the file inside the folder. I'm going to call this hooks. So what I want to do here is I want to export a, because if you don't, um, if you're familiar with, um, Redux, basically what we want to do here um, is if you're in the store, no, we're using the store, but if you're in a component, let's say, let's say we're in the registration form, because that'll be the first area we hook this up, there is a hook um, that you get part of React Redux called use um, selector or use dispatch and then you can use those methods to you know dispatch an action or get the state you need inside this component here from the global store where the global store is the sum of all the slices which has all the state and then interaction with the http service um so we actually we want to use a hook um but we want to rename it. And rather than use the built-in hook, like for example, I want to have use app dispatch. And this is recommended like way of doing things through the Redux documentation. If you check out the Redux toolkit documentation, essentially it's just, you know, some syntactical sugar over the top of the built-in functionality, which uses the use dispatch method. And, but the bonus is we can actually pass in our type here. And that's what we've created in the store. And then I can do the same thing for the use app selector, which uses the actually, this is going to be a slightly different. This is going to be this is a long name. This is going to be the typed use selector hook. And then you get the root state from our store. And then we can use the selector. And we'll need to bring that in as well. So just imagine we're in a component here, for example, and just ignore all this. If we were in, if we weren't in TypeScript, we would have to use the selector. Um, but, you know, it wouldn't be clear what the state was or anything like that. What we've done here is we've got our state. We've got the root state of our application. So this is, a, you know, this comes built in this method. It's basically a smart way that it looks at the store, looks at all the reducers, and then it looks at all the slices, and then it looks at all the state that you have in your application. Um, and then it gets that. And... It's, Analogously for the app dispatch, it looks at all of the actions that you got. Um, so, you know, we've got, you know, register, uh, all those sorts of things. Um, and then it has this type use selector hook. 
uh, that's a generic type. So that's built in, but it essentially takes the root state, um, which is that, um, and we can use the root state um, and then we can use the selector so we can tap into that global state when we're consuming it. I think I mixed up the two there. So yeah, that the app selector, that's based on the global state. Um, and then this dispatch here, uh, that's referring to the actions on the store or, you know, in the slice, which translates to the store. Um, so they're the hooks I wanted to use. Now let's just take a look at the, um, we need to use this, right? So we've set it up, but we haven't actually used any of this. So what we'll do is let's go to our index file. So in source, if we open up the index TSX file here, you know, when you use context, you need to wrap everything. Well, the same is true for, um, Redux. Like right now, our application isn't aware of these files. So what we can do here is we can have a parent tag, a wrapper, and we can just go ahead and wrap our entire application. So let's wrap our application here. And then we can pass in the store, which is just going to be the store that we created. So I'm just going to import this down here. So I'm going to import the store. And because we're in the index, we can just go to the store, which is that file here. And we also need to import from React Redux, the provider. So now we're passing in our global state and we're having this wrapper component around our application. So it makes it accessible for the entire application. You can see the benefit here already in terms of um, if you're comparing this to the context where let's say you had an auth context and then you had a product context and then you had like 10 different forms of context, you'd get like a very, very nested structure here. Whereas this puts it all in one place uh, and refers to it. Um, through the reducers and it helps simplifies the uh, noise when you consume that. Um, in addition to the being more performant as well um, than use context. But use context has its places and it's definitely worth using. Um, but of course we're focusing on Redux and Redux toolkit with TypeScript in particular. Uh, so we may as well talk about the benefits of it. Um, I mean, the con is there's a lot of boilerplate to get it set up initially, but I think the benefits for big projects outweigh the cons. Okay, so now we have that. We pretty much, we have access to be able to use that in our um, application. So let's just go ahead and we'll just open up. Um, well, let's just, we're gonna keep working in these but we can close the index file. We can close this hooks file uh, and we can close this store file because we're not going to have any more reducers that we'll need there. And let's just start to have a look at the registration form component, for example. So right now we have this use input hook. So that's a custom hook that we've created. Um, but when we create a new user, we're just getting back the new user. So let me just go ahead and start the server here. So I run npm start. And my nest server is on 3000, I think. So I'll just use this one on whatever it gives me, 3001 probably. So the home page is pretty bland, but let's go to our register method and let's press F12. And let's just type in some things. Now that's actually just logging out the information there. We've got the email name and password, which our server is expecting. And if we look at the database, you can see I create a whole bunch of here. I think I've already got one for this email, for example. 
whole bunch of users here. So we actually want to use our structure that we've set up, our service and our slice, use our Redux store, and we want to be able to fire an action. So this is, you know, we've done the boilerplate uh, for the registration. How do we consume that? So what we need to do is we need two things. So recall that we had that dispatch method. We want to dispatch a, um, an action to register. So to be able to do that, we need that hook that we just uh, set up there. So let's just find a bit of place where we can do that. Um, let's just do it here, I suppose, below these custom hooks. So we can have this dispatch method here, oh, which uses that hook, use app dispatch. So I believe that auto imported for us. So we can see that we got those use dispatch hook, which is just a use dispatch uh, wrapper with our particular type. Um, and we'll also want, we want to use the app selector. So we can bring that in as well. Now that just takes whatever the state of our application is and notice how we get this state is this object with all the state. So it's, you know, it's intelligent now. So if that wasn't there, we wouldn't be getting that. Um, and what we'll do is we'll select the auth state. So that's pretty much everything that we created so far. But if you had other states like the product state, you'd have a product state in there like that. And then you can go ahead and you can select what you want from there. So we can use object destructuring, for example, and we want to know if it's loading or if it's a success. Um, so if it's, you know, you, you make the call, you dispatch the action, which we haven't done yet, but we have the hook that allows us to dispatch the action. Um, let's also bring in navigate, the navigate hook. So this is going to be the use navigate. This is coming from React Router. Um, because let's say they register, we want to, you know, we want to take them to the login page so they can log in, for example. Um, so what we'll do is we've got this on submit handler thing. I think what we'll do is we basically, if they make it all the way to the end, what we'll do is we won't clear the form here. We'll dispatch an action and we're going to dispatch the register action and we're going to pass in the new user. So we're going to need to import that register uh, method here. That's coming from our auth slice. So we have that register method here. We make the HTTP request. Essentially, that's what that's doing. But then we can also tap into the state of our application. So we dispatch that method. And what we'll do here is we can actually have a use effect hook here. So I'm just going to write this here, use effect. I'll bring in that snippet there. Uh, let's get rid of this here. So basically this use app selector hook, this sort of tracks the value of our global state. So right now what we want to do, because on the submit handler, when we click the button where dispatching this register method, we want to tack in to see when it's successful. And if it's successful, then we'll clear the form and we'll navigate somewhere. So basically what we can do here, and I think I might need to import this hook. Do I not have it? Let's just get it. So 
So what we can do here is we can say if it is successful, um, what we'll do is we'll just have this dispatch method here and we'll have the ability to reset the global state. So we're going to need to bring that in as well. Um, which is coming from here as well. So you click the button, you make the, you fire the action, you get some things are loading, it changes the global state. If it's successful, and we're also referring to the dispatch method here. Um, if that fires and it is successful, um, you know, we can clear that state, which sets the loading back to false and stuff like that. And then we can clear the form and we can also navigate to the sign-in page. So, <clears throat> just a couple more things here. Just below here, I want to say, rather than returning that, I want to say, if it is loading, what I'll do is I'll return and I'm just going to use a material UI component. So we can just go ahead and get that in there. I believe that auto imported for us. Let's see. Oh, I'm going to need to export this. Uh... Wait, let's see here. I don't want it to be part of the service necessarily. Um, wait, is it? I think it's part of the slice. My bad. So yeah, yeah, that's coming from the slice. Um, so what I'll do is, since that's a, um, you know, reset, so reduce a method or whatever. Um, rather than one of these, um, I'm going to export that separately. So I'm going to export the reset method here, which is just this off slice up there above, part of the actions there. So they're all actions. Uh, everything in here is an action, and then based on that off slice, um, we can use object destructuring to get the reset method there. While I'm here, I may as well get the uh, particular user, for example. So let's get the selected user. So this is based on the state, like the root state. So let's get that. And let's just return back the auth state, for example. And we'll just save that. So I think what I was doing is I was, oh yeah, I was creating this spinner thing. So let's go to our registration form. Rather than returning the form, if it's loading, what we want to do is return a spinner. And I'm just going to give it a little bit of styling here. Give it a margin top of 64 pixels. And I'm also just going to make the color um, primary. So let's go ahead and save that, see if anything's broken. We've done a lot of changes, um, getting that initial setup going. So we're on the register page. Let's think of a name. So Mike um, Doe. And, oh, that's the email. Mike at hotmail.com and let's make a password one two three four five six one two three four five six register us you see that spinner there for a second and then actually rerouted us to the signing page so we've effectively what we've done there is we've set up our redux 
um, with asynchronous operations and stuff like that. And let's just confirm that. Let's just check the database. Let's just refresh this here. Um, well, let's, let's have a look here. Go to Amazon, go to users. Oh, is it not there? Oh, it's at the end of the list rather than the beginning. So we've got Mike at hotmail.com. So everything worked and that's amazing. Um, what we need to do now is we need to extend it. So we have the login um, stuff going as well. Um, but what I might just do is I might just jump back over to the back end because I want to create a method um, and which checks a JSON web token. And what I want to do that for, or why I want to do that for, is I want to protect the home page. Right now, you can go to the home page. And this is where we'll have our products. I want to protect that route, basically. Um, but to do that, I need to ch check whether or not the JSON web token is valid or not. Um, so let me just go back to the back end, and I'll set some things up there. Uh, let's see. So I want to keep these files open. I'm just going to go to my API here. And I'm going to open my auth controller, for example. So I'm getting... I'm just going to turn off one of the extensions I have here. So... I think it's pretty ESLint or ESLint. I think it's this one. Let me disable that. Oh, I'm gonna have to reload now. I don't know if that got rid of my terminal or not. Okay, that's good. Although the error's still there. I think oh it's ESLint. ESLint. So let's get that off. Disable the workspace. Just reload that. Now hopefully that gets rid of that error there. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, no, I just haven't set up the project for linting or anything like that. I think there's a conflict between the my settings and my extensions and the default ES linting. But I want to I want to create another method that checks our tokens. So let's see. We've got register, we've got login there. We need to be able to say verify a JSON web token. So I'm going to give back a HTTP status of OK because we're not creating a resource, but we will need to post something in our payload. So I'm going to have the payload here. And it's just going to be a JSON web token. With a, which is the string type here. Uh, I can get rid of this type here. This will be inferred. Um, but I'm going to need to create a verify JWT method. And I'm going to need to rename this to verify JWT. Um, so... Oh, and this should be verified JWT as well. So we get the payload.jwt. So we're expecting this object in from the front end. And then we want to check that. So we're going to need to create that. So let's just come to the bottom here. And let's just create that method there. So this is going to be an async function here. So verify JWT, we're going to get our JWT, which is the string. And what I'll give back is I'll give back a promise. And we already have the JSON web token and it's already going to be decoded. What I'll just give back here, I'll just give the expiration back. You could give back the whole user or whatever you want here. Um, I'm just going to get the expiration date back because I want to check the expiration date uh, against what the time is of the user and compare the two. And then 
if the JSON web token's valid, then I'll allow people to enter the route, for example, because right now, if they had a JSON web token in local storage and I was looking at that, uh, they, that might be enough to suffice to trick React into thinking that it's valid. Um, but we want to explicitly check that. It depends how sensitive your application is as well. Like if it doesn't matter that someone sees one of these pages, um, but you know, you prefer admins to see it only. I mean, chances are no one's going to actually go ahead and do all this, but if you had sensitive stuff, this is, you know, the better approach, uh, more secure, have two checks basically. Um, so I'm just going to have this try catch thing here. So what I'm going to do is I am going to refer to the JSON web token soakers. So I've already got that in here. This is coming from the library. Um, this JWT service. And I'm going to call the verify async method on our JWT. So I'm going to need to await for this because this takes a little bit for this to happen. Um, but what I can do is I can use object destructuring to get the expiration date from awaiting for that. And then what I can do is I can return that. But if there's some sort of error and they don't have a valid JSON web token or they just, you know, they give us a string uh, that isn't, or some data that isn't the JSON web token. So remember our server has created JSON web tokens. So in memory, it has access to all of the, you know, the valid JSON web tokens. And then we're essentially going to verify if the one that they've sent from the client from the front end uh, matches. Now, I'm not sure if this already takes into consideration the expiration date or not. Uh, it probably it does. I just haven't read deep into the documentation. If someone could confirm that, that'd be awesome in the comments there. Um, but I'm going to play it safe and give back the expiration and check that manually. Um, but we'll do that on the front end. Um, but if anything goes wrong, I'm just going to give back a HTTP exception. And I'm just going to say invalid JWT. Uh, and I can get the HTTP status. And let's just say that they're unauthorized. So I think I'll just need to import that in there. So that's that method there. That should be that set up. So let's check it out. So I'm just going to open up Postman. I have this um, I have a login method as well so let's create a login method wait where is the login oh, I don't have a login that's surprising I must have accidentally duplicated it and deleted it um, oh let's just register a new person for now we'll come back to that login uh, thing so let's just call it John 100. Okay. So we get the ID, we get the name. Let's go ahead and I, I'm actually realizing I haven't set this up. So, okay. So I think I'm going to need the login method after all. Let me just check my controller here. Yeah, we get the token back in the login method. Okay. Well, let's just create a login method here. So this is going to be, let me just duplicate this register method. I'm going to change this to login. At the end of this, I'll probably put the Postman collection uh, in. Um, so let's say that. Oh, no. Okay, let's change that. Let's change that back. All right, this wasn't part of the plan. This is the register method. I'll save that. 
Um, now this is going to be login. I need to save as. That's probably what I did before as well. Oh, what's going on here? I'm just going to create a new one because I'm obviously having some difficulties with this. So this is going to be register. I'm going to close this. I'm just going to create a new one because this is borderline ridiculous. So let's copy that. And let's call this a post. Um, so this is going to log in here. I'm going to save this as login into my Amazon. I'm going to save that. Okay. Now I'm just going to copy this here into my body. Raw JSON. Get rid of the name. Uh, and then make that request there. And okay, finally. All right, I got my token there. So what I want to do is I want to check that token. So I want to put in the JSON web token here. Verify that. And we get an expiration date back. Let's say if I add one more letter here, for character, we get this 401 invalid JSON web token. So we can see that that is working. So when the user logs in, they're going to get their JSON web token back. But let's say, you know, they come back to the browser or whatever, um, and they already have their token in local storage. We want to be able to check that before taking them to a secure route. So I'm going to actually explicitly call this method. There is one extra, you know, API call, it's particularly if you go from logging in to, um, you know, because when you logged in, you get the JSON web token, you validated. But I think it's better to, you know, go for the more secure route and have that double check there. Uh, there's probably other ways to do it as well. Uh, this was just the easiest way I could think of uh, to secure the routes. But we'll come back to that. We'll, we'll probably focus back more on the Redux side of things. But just before doing that, I just wanted to fix up a couple of things on the uh, API side of things because I just realized I haven't set up error handling um, in other parts of the application. So right now, like if you register with the wrong details or log in with the wrong details, you get a response back, but you're getting a 200 back. I just got reminded when I wrote this here um, and we'll need that in our Redux to detect if it is in the error state or not. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's just go ahead and add in those uh, other exceptions for other methods here. So we can see we have this register method. Um, and just to remind ourselves, we're just, you know, if there's an existing user, for example, we're giving back the string email is taken. So rather than giving back that, um, we actually just want to throw an error here. So we can throw an error saying an account if that email already exists. Now, I don't think I'm going to go too deep into error handling. I, I do have error handling um, in particular for Nest.js on the back end in my LinkedIn clone video. I've got a whole hour long video on that. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. I just need something basic that's going to be working here. Um, but I probably will go into slightly more detail on the front end about um, error handling. Um, although the Redux stuff does a pretty good job of uh, doing that for us. Uh, so it could be that we don't actually end up going too deep into that. We don't need the need to, but if there is a need to, we will. Um, I want to focus more on the Redux and the payment gateway. So that's going to be the cool new thing either in the next or the following video is um, coming up with a payment gateway and doing everything with Redux and pipe script and everything like that. Um, but we've already got the beginnings of a really nice structure here. Um, let's just get this second. Um, so that's for the registration. Let's go to the login method, for example. 
if there's no reduce uh, if there's no user uh, we're returning null let's just throw an error here and let's just say the credentials are invalid and we can have this unauthorized thing here again that's all good um okay so that's all i really wanted to do on the back end as you can see it was just a couple of tweaks there um for the error handling and then also the new api method so let's just go ahead and close those we've tested those to work um and now we can return back to our redux side of things so let's um Let's extend it out a little bit. So before I go to securing the routes or anything like that, let's go back to the Redux side of things. Um, and we'll go to our service, let's say. So let's build out the login methods. Log out is going to be quite simple. And then we've got that new verify JWT method that we just created. So let's just go ahead and do that. So let's just shift alt down all this code here oh not all of that actually what happened i just wanted this part here um okay so let's make our login method here and this is going to take a user which is going to be the login user so let's just get that and if we just look at that type there, that's just the email and string or the email and password. And we are expecting to get that token back or the string. We saw that. Um, well, that's the verify method. In the login method here, we saw that token there. So we can take the user, the login user, get that token or null back. Um, actually, I think we even have a better type than that. Um, let's see here. We've got this JSON web token. So that's the token string or null. So let's just go ahead and get that type in there. It looks a bit better. Same thing. So we'll import that. Save that. We call Axios. We make a post request. Hit the same base change this to login and then part of our json body that we want to give is the user which is the object with the email and the password um, basically we need that we await for that but then we want to do some stuff so basically axios puts this into the data for us if it's successful so if the response data is present there i uh, will still return it but if it's not successful we'll get back null here um, but if that is the case, what we want to do is we actually want to go to local storage and we want to set an item and we want to set the JWT and we want to stringify the response data. So what's happening there, you know, you log in, you get back this post request here. If it's successful, then we want to store that token in, um, you know, in local storage. So then next time we come to the website, we can access that. And we'll set that up too in just a moment. Um, we also want to not only have the JSON web token, but we also want to have, you know, the user. So right now, if, if you're doing it all in one go, you will have the user object because you know you're logging in you're setting the user object but let's say we're coming back to the website and we only have the json web token in storage and our application's in a new state we actually want to decode that and then set the uh, state for the user based off that so what i can do here is i can have the decoded jwt and that's going to be of the type uh, decoded jwt and so when you decode the JWT, you get back the, you know, all the information that you've decoded. So that's the user object, the display user for us. But then you also get the expiration date and the initialization date. So 
I'm going to run JWT, the code. And I'm going to get the response, the data, uh, the token. And then I'm going to set the local storage to set the item. And I'm going to set the user as well. So you could do this in one go. Uh, I just want to have that separation there. I think it makes it a little easier uh, to distinguish between the JSON web token and the user because we're going to do that extra check. So we're going to need to uh, have both there. Again, you could do this in one go, uh, but I'll leave that up to the viewer. Uh, this JWT decode thing, um, I'm going to need to import that. So let's just do that at the top here. Import JWT decode from JWT dash decode. Um, so let's return back to our login method here. So what we got here is, um, you know, you, you type in the email and password, make HTTP request. If all is well and good, we set the JWT in local storage by stringifying the object. And we also do the same thing for the JSON, the decoder JSON web token, which is the user. Um, based on the token, we get the decoded token, but then we just want to set just the user portion of that. Um, so that pretty much is that, and then we can just return that response there. Uh, with that in mind, let's go back to our auth slice. And right at the top, um, where we have this initial state, even before that, right at the top, um, what we want to do is we want to, we essentially, where we had these here, the JSON web token and the user, we want to come back to those and get those um, if they exist. So when you come to the website, we might want to access local storage. And then depending on if we have a JSON web token or a user, um, you know, then that's how we can make one of those further API requests to tell if we're authenticated or not. Um, so let's do that. So let's get the stored user. And the stored user, this is going to be a string or a null because how we're getting it is we're getting it through local storage. We're going to get the item. And we're going to get the user item that we just created. And local storage is either going to be there or it isn't. And if it is there, it's going to be a string. So I'm going to have another variable here. I'm going to make this slightly bigger so it fits onto one page nicely. And I'm going to have the user here. <clears throat> this is going to be the display user type or potentially null. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to have two bangs. And I'm going to check this store user because if it's a string, I have two bangs on it. Uh, the first bang will falsify it, and then the second will make it true. Um, however, if it's you know null or undefined or whatever, um, it won't exist because not null is going to be true, and then not true is going to be false. Um, so if that's false, uh, it will be null, and we can do that. Um, but we're going to get the JSON token back. So let's use, let's pass it. So let's use that pass method there for the stored user. Otherwise, we'll just get back null. Um, we're going to copy the same sort of thing for the other token as well. Um, I don't mind a slight bit of duplication in the logic because uh, it makes it easier. But if you do prefer to do this in one go, you could have the one token. Um, it's just you'll need to change slightly some of the logic. Um, this is JSON web token. It's just going to be the JWT type there. Uh, same thing, but this is going to be the store JWT and the store JWT here. Um, so yeah, you could even refactor that if you want to. Again, I'm not going to worry about that. Um, but what that means is now we have the ability to do this. We can set the user and see how it was null. If it's not there, we'll just go revert back to null. But if it is from the 
um, local storage, we can go ahead and use that. So that's awesome. Um, and we'll use that to do some route protections and stuff later on. But let's actually return... Let's create some more um, stuff in our service because we're going to need the registrate, the login method, which we got here, and also the logout and verify JWT here. So let's just return back to our login method. And we can see that we've actually set it up pretty nicely. We've set the JSON web token and that. So actually, that's all set up now. The login method's done. So we can actually get ship that out there. Um, I'm going to have the logout function. This is going to be super simple. This is just going to... Um, not going to do anything, but it's just going to remove some stuff for us. So basically, the local storage, we can actually go ahead and remove the items. Because if we log out, it thinks we're logged in based on the tokens in storage and then swapping that over into memory. But we can actually say we want to remove the user from local storage and we want to remove the JSON web token from local storage. And then we'll configure the rest of that in this slice here. here. Um, but in terms of delegating that uh, local storage or asynchronous sort of task, uh, that's delegated to this service here. And finally, let's come up with this last method here. Let's just copy this one here because we want to be able to verify the JSON web token. So that's like that. Let's just create that and we'll call that method the verify JSON web token thing. I'm going to get rid of this block of logic here. Um, again, this is going to be another post request. Um, we're going to hit the verify JWT method. And we're going to pass in our JWT. And recall that it's sort of nested in this object sort of way this time. Um, and this is just going to be a JWT, which is a string there. So we pass in the JSON web token. We want to get back a Boolean. Oops. Boolean, um, just to say, is it verified or is it not verified? Now we're going to get the response back and that's going to give us the expiration date. So what we can do here is we can say, if there's a response, if there's a response data, um, well, if there isn't, you know, it means it hasn't been validated. So we can't give them permission to be authenticated. So we just return false there. But if there is a response data, I'm going to create this constant variable, uh, JWT expiration milliseconds, let's say. And that's just going to take the response data. And I think that in, um, in the um, API call, what we sent back was in seconds. So we just need to translate that into milliseconds. Um, so we get the expiration. And then we just times that by a thousand. And then what we do, and the reason we do that is we can check if the JSON web token, the expiration date on our JSON web token, if that date is larger than the date now, which is going to be in milliseconds, um, it means it's valid. But if it's not, it's going to be invalid. And then we're going to get that return statement to be false. Um, so even if they have a JSON web token in local storage, um, we're going to set it up so that, um, you know, we can protect routes or they're not authenticated unless, you know, it's been confirmed. So that's the verify JWT method. And in fact, that's all the methods we need in this service here. Um, let's go ahead and <clears throat> return back to our slice. So now we just, we've got the structure set up. We just need to, you know, wire it more things up essentially. So let's just go ahead and copy this down here. And let's have the login method. 
we're going to create an async thunk based on the login page this time. We're going to take a user. This is going to be a login user this time. And then we're going to have this try catch. We'll import the model here or the interface. Um, so we have this try catch once again. We can have a login method here. As you see, this is a reusable block of code essentially. Uh, you could refactor that if you wanted to. Um, I'm just going to reject with value unable to log in. So that's that set up. Let's go to our extra reducers. Now we're going to duplicate this down here. And we're going to have the login method. And where it says register here, I'm going to change that to login. So we've got the login pending state, login fulfilled state, and the login rejected state. Um, oh, that's not a semicolon there. Um, so if it's if you're logging in, we'll set the global loading state uh, to true there, and the login page and the registration page they're on separate pages. Um, so that's what's sharing the is loading is success all those states there, and because they're on separate pages, uh, that's perfectly fine to do it this way, and then it saves us the variables and stuff like that within the authentication uh, module or feature. Um, but this one's always going to be the same here. And then we can reset it in the same way as well. So we can call that reset method. Um, so it just makes it a little cleaner. Um, but if you, of course, if you had two things going on the same page and you need to separate, you know, you might have to tee that up. Um, but it's pretty simple based off this structure here to do that, just more of the same. So basically, the loading state, that's going to be the same. The fulfilled state, um, if they if they register, um, it doesn't mean they're authenticated just yet because they haven't actually logged in and received their JSON web token. But if they log in, um, I can say this time we can set the JSON web token equal to the action uh, payload here because you get the token there, part of the payload. So... We can also go ahead and we can set the state to is authenticated to equals true true because by that stage if it's successfully fulfilled well then they are authenticated but if they get rejected we can just say is authenticated is equal to false so that's all well and good um I'm just looking at that reject thing. We've got is loading is false there. we got is error is true. The user we set to a null uh, user because they didn't log in. So there's no user. And is authenticated is false. Okay, so that's okay. Um, and then we got this reset. That's a async or a synchronous operation. Um, so let's just add in the last case, which is the verification of the JWT. So that's that, and we'll use that. <clears throat> so let's just grab that in. So where it says log in here, I'm going to Control D backspace and change that to verify JWT, uh, which refers to, oh, we need to create that. Okay, that's cool, we'll do that. I actually think we need to do this for logout as well. We got the logout thing here, let's just wrap that. So I'm just going to say um, log out um, auth log out and I'm just going to Uh, 
await auth service dot log out. Let's keep it like that. And then let's just copy this one down here. Uh, thinking about it, this one could potentially be not asynchronous, but I'm just going to leave it there because it might take a few seconds to interact with the local storage. I uh, don't think it really matters, but uh, just better be safe than sorry sort of thing. Um, so this is the verify JWT here. And this is the verify JWT. I'm going to take the JSON web token. And then I'm also going to have the Thunk API uh, as a callback. So I'm going to have this try catch thing going on here again. Oh, that's the wrong method. Here. So I'm going to try and verify the JWT. The JWT. Um, you know, if I get an error, I'll just say unable to verify. So that's that there. Now if I just check everything's looking good. Yep, looks good. Now if I just return back to my... I might have a log out method here firstly. Okay, so I'm going to create a logout method here. So I can just add a case here. Let's just copy this one here for a sec. So if logout is fulfilled, um, what I'll do is I will say Logouts fulfilled, it means the user's null. Um, I don't need that loading state there because this will be happening pretty quick. I'll set the JWT to null. And importantly, I'll set the is authenticated to false. And then that's all I need there, I believe. I'm going to change this to verify JWT in the pending state. Um, we're just loading the state. Um, if it's if it's fulfilled, they'll be false. They'll be true. And the authentication will be coming from the payload in that case. And then if it's rejected, is loading false, is errors true, is authenticated, is false. So let's just save that. And I think we pretty much have our entire slice or our entire reducer set up. Um, we've seen it work in the registration form. Perhaps we'll try get it going in the sign in form. So let's do that. And I think we could essentially copy a few things here. So Let's, um, like these hooks, for example, we're going to need those. Um, let me just grab these in, into our sign in form. I'll just put them here. I think we'll need navigate as well. So I'm going to copy that in. That's from there. Let's just... I don't know, these components are getting a little big. Probably should refactor those, but 
Um, we'll just ignore that for now. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so I've got use navigate. I've got the use app dispatch. I've got the use app selector. And then from the auth slice, I don't need register. I need the login method, but I will need the reset. Um, okay, so let me just scroll past those uh, custom hooks there. I'm going to need to initialize these things. So I'll do that here. So I've got uh, dispatch. So I can use the app dispatch uh, method there. It's going to have the state associated with it. You can see there when you hover over it. Is loading, is success. Um, we also want is authenticated here. Um, because when you sign in, it should change the state to is authenticated to true. And then we're going to use that. Uh, and then we've got this hook here, navigate to be able to navigate things. So right here, I'm going to, um, rather than clearing the form here, I'm going to say dispatch the login method. Oh, wait, what happened there? What's in the end? We're going to need to create, firstly, a login user of the type login user, which is just going to be the email and the password. And then we can dispatch the login method for the login user. So we got that. Um, here we can have something where it's like if is loading, and actually I might copy this from over here. Uh, yeah, I'll copy this one. So if it's in the loading state, just return back that. Um, so we're going to need to import that, save that, get the formatting going. Um, okay. And then I can get this use effect thing in here. So I'll copy that above the submit handler. So let's work on this logic here. So, okay. So basically if it's successful, we want to dispatch the reset. Oh, do we need to import that as well? So we'll get that use effect in there. Yeah, if it's successful, we need to dispatch the reset and clear the form. Um, and we might cut out this navigate logic into its own use effect hook here. So what I'll do is I'll have a second use effect hook. And rather navigating based on the success, we want to do it based on if it's authenticated or not. So it's essentially the same sort of thing, but it's just a little more uh, secure. So basically in this use effect here, we're going to depend on the is authenticated. So this will be false, but when you sign in, um, it's gonna trigger, when you click the button to sign in, it's gonna dispatch an action. It's gonna log in. It's gonna take a look at the login method. It's gonna realize that it's an async thunk. It's going to uh, go to the auth service. It's going to do the login method. Um, it's going to set some things in local storage for us. Uh, and then back in our slice, it has the state of that. So this is our global state here. Is loading a success is error. Um, actually, all our states up here. And if they're authenticated or not, as well as the JWT and the user there. Um, so that's happening when you click that button. Then if it's successful, it's going to reset the state back. Um, that will clear the is loading. Uh, so rather than giving back that, it will give back the form. Um, that will only happen flash for a second. 
uh, if that you probably happened so fast you won't even see it um but based on if you're authenticated or not we'll go ahead and we'll navigate to the home page um and we'll only if they're if they're not authenticated um we'll go ahead and return i like to do these checks in their hooks because sometimes they fire on first load and it just you know prevents that from occurring um so that's pretty much it with regards to that uh, where's this clear form thing uh, we define that up there um so yeah that's that's um that's looking good maybe we should try it out so let's go back into our sign in method here um i'm going to log in as mr john Pink. and i don't know if you saw that and when you go back to the sign page, it automatically takes you here. Let's go to the register page. Um, so that's, that allows you to go there. Um, but if I go to the sign in page, uh, okay, it lets you do that too. So and if I go back to the home page, does it, yeah, okay, so it allows you to do that. Um, so what we want to do is uh, we'll come back to not protecting the signing register pages. But what I want to do is, um, you know, go to this home page, for example. I just want to have like a button to log out. So it makes it easy uh, to log out and delete the tokens and stuff like that. But as you can see, the login method worked. Um, and obviously, if we go to our application here, it puts that into local storage for us there. Um, what I'll do is I'll just open up the home page. And I'm just going to have like something super simple here. So I'm going to have a H1. It's going to be called on home page. I'm going to have an A tag. It's going to be no href. I'm going to have a style here of um, background background color we'll just have something doesn't really matter what uh, yellow um, and then let's have also uh, what is it cursor pointer I think it is so it looks like a button and then I'll just say log out and then I'll have the handler. So on click, we'll have a log out handler, let's say, which we need to define. And then let's just spit out a few things like, um, you know, user, email. Um, so actually we're going to need to get a few things in here. So let's just go to our sign in form and we can use it to copy this here. We're going to need that. And let's import those. And we'll have is success, is loading. Let's get the user as well. Um, okay. So we've got the use app selector. We've got this dispatch method here. Let's create our logout handler. So we can do that by dispatching the logout method, which we'll need to need to do like that. 
and then we'll just say if there's a user you know give out the email um, actually we won't even do these ones that's all we'll do there so let's just take a look at the home page okay we've got a pretty bad button there let's just make it slightly better Let's give it a height of 40 pixels, width of, I don't know, let's say 60 pixels. And let's give it a padding of 8 pixels. Let's save that, see if it looks any slightly better. Okay, so yeah, okay, we've got this logout button. Right now we're logged in, we've got this here. If we click log out, it just logs us out and then we no longer have that data and then doesn't display that. So the logout's working all right for us. So that's awesome. <clears throat> so we've pretty much set up all the things now relating to Redux. We've got both synchronous and asynchronous stuff. We've set up the um, store, the slice or reducer, the actions associated with that, and the service to all the HTTP cores. Um, we're able to subscribe and have consistent state all through our application. So everything's perfect. Um, the only thing I want to do is I just want to protect this page uh, based on verification of the um, of the page there. So what I'll do is I'm going to uh, let me just close a few things and I'm going to open a, I want to create a protected route. So perhaps in, um, yeah, in auth, in components here, <clears throat> I'm going to have a private route here. And this is going to be a TSX file. So let's just use the NFN snippet here. Private route. Actually, RAFCE. Private route. Now, what we're going to, how we're going to use this is in our um, app here. Um, you, I, I was playing around with this before. You can't simply have like private route, which wraps a route anymore. So you actually need to put that private route as an element into your route. Um, and then that will contain the page. So we just need to set that up. It's just... I don't know, the new version 6 of the router um, make, makes you have route as a direct child of route sort of thing. Makes sense, I suppose, but um, what I want to do is I want to essentially wrap the page. Um, so I want this home page here. Now, all the pages, they don't have any of its own state associated with it, so it makes it nice and simple. Uh, and that's sort of by design. But if I just go ahead and I just take the page, and the type of a page is going to be the JSX element, I can actually tap into that um, app selector. So if I just open up one of these again and copy this here, I can actually just go ahead and just copy these, these hooks here, and then just bring them in. So I'm just going to get these. And what I want from here is I want is success, is authenticated. I don't care about loading, but I do want the JSON web token. So I'm going to get that from the auth state. Um, and I might just move this because... This is like the main part here. And then we want to dispatch an action. Uh, and then we also want to have a use effect hook here. 
But basically what we're doing in terms of the page is we're just wrapping this around a page essentially and then outputting the page. Um, so we'll build that. Um, so we won't even have this here. It's going to look a little different than it normally looks. Um, but we can have this use effect and let me just bring the snippet in. So essentially what we'll do is we'll say if there's a change to the JSON web token, it means you've either logged out or you logged in um, as it successfully. You've successfully logged in or you've logged out. If either of those are true, um, so it could be the case that you've successfully logged in, um, what I'll do is I'll say if, well, if there's no JSON web token, um, because you might be able to successfully do something, but you don't have the JSON web token, or there's no JSON web token at all, I'm simply going to return. And if it returns, it means it hasn't, um, it's not going to dispatch the action to verify the JSON web token. Otherwise, we can dispatch the verify JWT method based on the JWT that we got based on the token. So what we can say, let's just save that. Um, we need to return something. So we'll do that at the bottom here. So we can say, are they authenticated? So we're subscribing to the global state or in Redux terms, where um, well, that is a Redux term. We're subscribing to the store. Um, if they aren't logged in, they'll be false. But recall when they log in, it changes the authenticated flag um, to true. Um, however, we're going to have this next check um, to check if uh, you know because we've got this. So basically, if they log in successfully and they get a response back, they're you know they're authenticated. So if you look at the slice here, um, this initial state of authentication being false or is authenticated is false. When you log in, um, it changes. So if you look at register, it doesn't change, but if you look at login, it does change it to authenticated to true, but. And that makes sense when you log in, you, you're authenticated. Um, but if you're coming back to the page at a later state um, and you haven't logged, you're not you know, firing the login action, but you've already been logged in, you're getting that token from local storage. And if, you, if someone knows that the existence of a token in local storage on your website is enough to authenticate, that's enough, that's like a loophole into your website. Not that many people will probably be doing it, but if you're building a secure application, um, you want a little bit more check than that. So I got this verified JWT method in the in the event that they're coming back. Um, you know, they're, we're setting that initially from the local storage um, here at the top there, lines 10 to 14, but we want to check that. So we've got this verify JSON web token method here. Um, and we're even getting true or false back depending on what the payload gives us. And that's how we're determining if they're authenticated or not. So in the private route, let's say we want to protect this route unless they're authenticated. Um, we're going to wrap this in the private route. So we're just taking the whole page and we're going to put them there. But basically, if they're authenticated, we can just show them the page. Otherwise, what I want to do here is I want to navigate them somewhere else. So I want to navigate um, and I'll replace the URL and I want to take them to the sign-in page. And that should be equals. And with that, if I go back to my app component and then I look at my routes here, uh, well, first things first, I can have a backup route if none of these routes work. So we can do that 
in version six of the React Router DOM by having this star here. And then you need to refer to the element. Um, so we can actually just pretty much copy this one in here. Uh, so let's get that in there. We need to get that. So, you know, we can just navigate them to the uh, home page. So anything's going to navigate them to the home page by default. Um, but if they're not logged in, the home page is going to navigate them to the sign in page here. And all we need to do is we just need to in this route for um, let's see here for the home page in the element here I'm just going to cut out home page here and then we're just going to try render the private route and that's going to be a self-closing tag and the page is going to be that home page element so we can save that um, so as you can see we're using a route within the routes for version 6 compatibility the element we're referring to is the private route which is just a wrapper around the original element so it just takes the page and it outputs it if we're authenticated otherwise we'll navigate them somewhere else so let's try all of that together and then we can conclude the video pretty much. So let's just try that. Let's try go to the home page. So see when we're going to the home page, it's rerouting us back here because we've got nothing in our JSON web token, in that, nothing in our local storage. So let's try and um, sign in, for example. If I sign in, it reroutes me to the that page there. Um, and I think what's going on is it's not actually showing us the user because uh, it's got a slightly different structure. So let's have a look at that. Um, but you can see that the private route did indeed work. So let's just take a look at the home page. And right now, we just want to console log uh, the user here. So let's look at our console. Okay, that was interesting. Uh, I'm going to try that again, make sure there's not a little glitch with our application here. Uh, let's go to, let's click on log out. See it, how it routes us back here now. Go to here. Now I'm going to try log in. I think when you log in, we might also because when we reload the page, it's working. I think we also might need to update the user. So let me try, look into that. Uh, let's see. I'm going to put a console log here for the action payload. Put a number here. Just trying to debug this. Let's log out. So everything's working good. We just got uh, one slight inconsistency here. I'll take a look at that. Okay, so there's something going on. And actually this video has gone on 
for a long time now, over two hours. So uh, I might focus on that in the fixing that little issue in the next video. Um, but just to recap everything that we've done here today, um, we set up a store. We we set up a global store, a Redux store. This manages our state for all of our features. So it has reducers of each of our slices. So we have an auth slice that we're referencing. We've set up a TypeScript, so we have type inference all the way through. We have this here. Um, we've set up some initial state and we've also created the registration login, logout verification methods. They refer to a service, HTTP requests for most of those. Most of our reducers that we set up in our slice are extra reducers or async reducers. Um, but then we also have some synchronous tasks here. And then we've pretty much just wrapped our entire application uh, in our index.js with the store. So all of our components have access to that, similar to how you would do using context. Um, and then we've also done this private route here. Um, so just in relation to the Redux stuff, we have our use app dispatch and use app selector. That's how we can select stuff from the store um, and dispatch actions. And then that's how we can manage state through our, our application. And then consuming that state, um, we can do checks to you know, guard the route, for example, make a private route if they're not authenticated, for example. So we've seen that um, working. We'll fix up the user um, thing in the next video. Um, and in the next video, I want to talk about setting up, um, probably need like get the home page going, get that. So it might be good to delegate that issue into the home page. Um, and yeah, after we set that up, we want to use the home page. So the home page is essentially the product page. Uh, so it's sort of exciting because we can click on things um, from that view and then set up our payment gateway. I'm thinking of using Stripe JS for the payment gateway from there. So uh, if that's something you're interested in, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, thanks so much for watching this one, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.